Well, good evening, and thank you so much for continuing with us in our studies of the book of Deuteronomy. And what we're going to do is, as we normally do, it's, it's a very, very simple format. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to read the Scriptures, then we're going to study the Scriptures together. But let's begin in prayer, asking that God would help us as we study His words. Let's pray together. Father, You are good. You are all-powerful. You are awesome and glorious. And Father, You are the one true God who speaks. And Father, when You speak, it is so clear we cannot miss. Father, help us, therefore, as we turn toward Your Word by Your Spirit. Father, as the evil one and our own flesh would seek to keep us from You, from hearing Your Word, which can transform us to be more like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, would You overcome the evil one? Would You silence the accusations even of our own hearts? by reminding us afresh of the glorious good news concerning Jesus Christ, whose blood has been shed, establishing the new covenant in which you will rejoice to do us good, in which your Spirit is placed within us, by which we have the forgiveness of sin. So, Father, help us afresh to know the beauty, the glory of the new covenant, May we by your Spirit draw near to your throne of grace to behold something of your glorious nature contained within your Word even revealed to us. So help us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to read to us the first part of Deuteronomy chapter 6. And this evening, my intention is for us to cover the, the teaching that we find in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and Deuteronomy chapter 7. But I'm going to begin by just reading the first part of chapter 6, but we're going to cover all two chapters together. So this is Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 1. And this is the commandment, the statutes, and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son, and your son's son, by keeping all the statutes and his commandments which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you, in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord, is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children." and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And as we've already asked, our longing is that the Lord may bless our time together in His Word. Last week in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and chapter 5, we looked at what it really meant for Israel and then for us as the church, as Christians, to hear. The command appeared again and again, even as it has done in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, hear, O Israel, Shema, hear, O Israel. And we looked at what that meant for us as Christians, as church, to shema, to hear what God was saying to us. We, we looked at what it meant for us to hear His statutes and His commandments. And like I said, in this next section, we find it repeated again, shema, verse 4, hear, O Israel. We thought about what it meant for us, therefore, to live lives 
hearing the Word of God, and that was really lives of worship. In these next two chapters, we find reasons given or motivation given to worship God. On Sunday morning, we looked at the story in Mark chapter 14 where a woman takes an alabaster jar full of precious ointment and she pours it over the head of Christ. And we thought about extravagant worship. It was great seeing those who look after our Facebook page this week on Monday as a, as a way of following up on our sermon, our teaching on Sunday, asking the question, well, well what is extravagant worship for you? What, what does it look like? This evening in chapter 6 and 7, we're looking at motivations for our worship, motivations, reasons why we should live lives that are just full of examples of extravagant worship. If you've ever been asked the question, but, but why do you serve? Why do you worship God? Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 7 provide the answer to that question. And now you may respond by saying, yeah, but why would I want to go to, to Deuteronomy to, to find out an answer like, this is why you should worship God? Why would it go all the way back to a, a dusty old book like Deuteronomy? I suppose the, the clearest and most straightforward answer to that type of question would be along these lines. The greatest worshiper who has ever lived, who's ever walked upon the face of the earth, well, it's the person of Jesus Christ Himself, the greatest worshiper of God, the greatest servant of God, and also God incarnate. So surely if we want to learn lessons about worship, then the primary place we would look to is the greatest worshiper who has ever lived and what he can teach us about worship. He has this exchange with the devil at the beginning of his earthly ministry where the devil takes him out into the wilderness, or rather the Spirit leads him out into the wilderness. And when he's in the wilderness, the Spirit comes to him and tests him, tempts him to abandon true worship of his Father, and instead either to worship the evil one or to focus in upon himself, but not to worship God. The interesting thing, and you may not have noticed this, is that when Jesus is responding to the evil one, to the devil, the tempter, every single one of his responses is rooted in the Scriptures. Now, you might say, well, I knew that. I knew that each time Jesus says, no, I'm not going to worship you because it is written. But I wonder if you noticed before that in every single response to the evil one, Jesus is quoting from one particular book. One book is mentioned or, or one verse is taken in every re response to the evil one that Jesus gives. They're from Deuteronomy. Now, I know there's a psalm thrown in there as well, but even in that quotation, Jesus refers back to Deuteronomy, and it happens to be in chapter 6 and verse 16 when he says this, "'You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. The evil one quoting a psalm to him, and yet Jesus responds in every single instance by using a quote from the book of Deuteronomy. So Jesus, in the midst of this warfare for worship, his go-to book in the whole of the Old Testament is Deuteronomy. It's like this is his sword in the midst of this battle of worship. And I would say that if the book of Deuteronomy was good enough for Jesus to go to, then surely this should be our go-to book as well, imitating our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 7, it effectively opens up four reasons for worshiping God, four motivations for worshiping God. So following um, Wearsby and his lovely little commentary or, or um, devotional on the book of Deuteronomy, he, he breaks it down like this. Deuteronomy 6 from verse 1 to verse 19 provide the first reason 
for worshipping God. And then verse 20 down to the end of chapter 6 provide the second reason for worshipping God. The third reason then for worshipping God is found from chapter 7 verse 1 down to the end of verse 16. And then the fourth and final reason that this portion of Scripture gives for worshipping God is from verse 17 down to the end of chapter 7. So we have these four blocks of material, each one providing a reason for worshipping God and each one building on the one that's already been given. So we'll take them one at a time. Reason one for the worship of God in Deuteronomy which is from verse 1 down to the end of verse uh, 19 there, and it's very simply this, love. Why do you worship God? Because I love God. My worship comes out of my love for God and the love that God has showered upon me. I love Him because He first loved me, but the reason that I worship is love. We find that there in chapter 6 and verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Last week we thought about the fact that when Jewish people were leaving their homes, they would have these verses here hung up or written on the doorposts or hung in some sort of hanging container, these verses would be hanging inside of them. So that as they're leaving their homes, that they're hanging right there to remind them to hear, O Israel, to remind them that the Lord their God is one and that they are to love Him with all their heart and with all their soul and with all their might. Look at verse 9. This is where this idea comes from. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So a, a Jew who is being faithful to these scriptures will have them written and hanging on the doorposts and the front gates of their homes. But it wasn't just the gates that they hung them on. Look at verse 8. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes eyes. These verses have been and still are taken literally by Jews. They have these things called tefillin. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And effectively, it's just little boxes that they attach to their forehead between their eyes, or some are placed on the arm and they're bound around the hands. And they contain these verses here, and the basic idea is when they're in prayer, and one of the prayers that they would be quoting are, are verses 4 and 5 of Deuteronomy chapter 6, and their eyes are looking ahead, they literally have the commandments as frontlets on, right in front of their eyes. Or if they look down to their hands as they're in prayer, they are on their hands and bound around them. And the basic idea is that they're ever putting this in front of their eyes, that this is what they are doing. Deuteronomy 6 goes even further than that, because what it says in verse 6 is, these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. But basically, everywhere they looked, if they looked forward, they were supposed to see them. If they were going out of the front door of the house, they're supposed to see this command. As they're leaving the gate, they're supposed to see the command. As they look to their hands and things they're about to do, they're supposed to be reminded of the commandments. As they look out on the world, they're supposed to see it through the lens of this commandment. To hear and remember that the Lord their God is one and that they are called to love Him with every fragment of their being. Now, we don't wear the, the tefillin, but we have some similar things going on. I wear on the, the left hand here, second finger in from the small one, or the one right next to it, I should say, a gold band. And it's my wedding ring, and it's designed to remind me 
Not just of the fact that I'm married, but I'm called to love my wife. I enjoy watching sailing vlogs, videos of people sailing, um, sometimes around the world or in different parts of the world. And you can often have that desire when you're, you're seeing these things that I would just love to go and sail right around the world in a, in a huge sailboat. It would be stunning. And then I look at my hand and remind myself, I'm not going to do that because I love my wife. And that's not something that my wife would love to do. Out of love for my wife, and, and this is serving as a reminder, I'm not going to do that. I, I might be tempted to throw myself into work or service in a thousand different ways and to spend my time doing lots of other things. And yet I look at this band on my finger here and I'm reminded, no, I, I love my wife and I'm called to love my wife, so I'm not going to pour myself into all these other things. I have to make sure I have time and space for her. Why? Because I love her. The Coptic Christians in Egypt have a tradition which stretches back um, generations, centuries even. And unlike a wedding ring, which can be removed, or we might say in our culture, well, we wear crosses around our necks to, to remind us of the fact, well, that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm called to love Christ, to love God, and the cross reminding us a little bit like a wedding ring, but you can always remove a wedding ring. You can always take a chain with a cross off. The Coptic Christians in Egypt will have a cross tattooed on the wrist, sometimes both, but normally at least the right wrist. And the basic idea is it can never be removed. So they're reminded they are always and ever to love Christ who died on the cross for them. Whenever they stretch out their hand to do something, the, their wrist becomes visible, reminding them as they're about to perform some sort of action, they belong to Christ. It allows others to see. You, you can tell who the Christians are in Egypt. They're easily easy to tell. Get them to shake your hand, and as they stretch out their hand, it will become visible. The cross will be on their wrist. It, it can never be hidden. Am I encouraging you to get tattoos? No, I'm encouraging you to worship Jesus. To remember when you look out at the world, which can distract you in so many different ways. Love God, it's supposed to be before your eyes. To remind you as you stretch out your hands to do various different things. Love God. You know, the, the tattoo is simply designed to remind them they belong to Christ. And everything that they're going to do, the actions that they're going to perform, are supposed to be done out of love for Christ. When motivations arise from within your own heart, love God, love Christ. So the first reason and motivation in worship is love. And that's what it's speaking about from verse 1 to verse 19 in Deuteronomy chapter 6. The second reason, which is found from verse 20 down to the end of the chapter, is very simply this. Gratitude. The, the first reason, why should I worship and serve God? Love. The second reason, why should I worship and serve God as well as love? Well, gratitude, thankfulness. When I was at college, I was persuaded, Bible college, I was persuaded to learn the biblical languages, um, both Greek first of all, and then six months later to start learning Hebrew. As I was beginning to um, learn these languages, and initially I, I struggled, it was completely different than anything I'd done before, and it was really, really hard work. Real, you had to put real graft in to learn these things. And as I was working really, really hard to, to learn Greek and beginning to learn Hebrew, I heard a story that really annoyed me. I was so hoping it wasn't true. And the, the story goes 
like this. There was a particular lecturer in Greek, a Greek professor, and it wasn't in the college I was in, or that would have made me more angry, but um, he walked into his class, and they, like me, were beginning to learn Greek, and he began his um, semester of teaching by telling them all they had all been guaranteed to get an A grade at the end of the semester. They were guaranteed they would get the highest grade possible, and he wasn't joking. It took him a few minutes to convince them he was being deadly serious, and that they would be guaranteed an A in their studies of Greek. Once he convinced them that he was not lying and this was a fact, he then said to them, so what I would like from you in return, I would like you to study hard and to put as much effort in as you possibly can. Now, the reason that that really annoyed me is I was busy trying to, to learn Greek, to study Greek, and they'd just been given A's. I had to work really hard to get one of them. They were just gifted theirs. But what happened on the back of it is out of appreciation, thankfulness, gratitude for this gracious gift that their lecturer had given to them. Every single one of those students excelled and did better than anyone actually thought they would. What Moses is doing here is He's encouraging them to excel in worship by reminding them of what God has already done. What he does in these verses is he reminds them, we were slaves in Egypt. God has already delivered us. Judgment fell on Egypt. It didn't fall on us. God took us out of Egypt. He's already done that. He wiped out, He's already wiped out our most severe and angry of enemies, Pharaoh. He's dealt with him, and He's set us free. He's already provided for us in so many different ways, and already in the wilderness you have seen His provision in every imaginable way. Even the footwear didn't wear out for 40 years. They've already seen victories of various sorts. God's already done that. They've already seen some of their number settled in the land that was promised to God, and now they were just going to go over and take the rest of it. They've already seen what God has done for them. So based on what God has already done, one of the things that should be present with them is thankful hearts. Why should we worship God in this land that we're going in to possess? Because of what He's already done. Christian, why should you and I worship God? Because of what He's already done. He has already transferred us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His beloved Son. He has already redeemed us by sending His Son to be a propitiation, a sacrifice in which all of His anger is dealt with, that we might go free. He's already given us the spirit of adoption by which we get to cry out, Abba, Father. We already have forgiveness. We already have redemption. We already have the work of the Spirit in our lives already transforming us. And how many testimonies do we already have to the way that God has provided for us again and again and again before we even get started on the number of times that God has answered our prayers? Why should we excel in worshiping God? Why should we give extravagant worship? Just look back. Count your blessings. And we should then excel in worshiping God out of both love and gratitude. When you step into chapter 7, the third reason for worship is given. And this one is a little more tricky, but it's basically this. It's found in chapter 7 and verse 6. For you are a people 
holy to the Lord your God. The, the third reason for us to, to worship is best put like this. If I were to say um, to be holy, we, we have a, a segment that we don't fully unpack that. So let me put it like this. The, the third reason for worship is separation. You're supposed to be different. Why should we worship? Because we're supposed to be different. The, the rest of the world is not worshiping God, so we're supposed to be worshiping God, which means we're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be separate. Th this entire section at the start of chapter 7 begins and ends with kind of two verses functioning like brackets. So in verse 2 it says this, and when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them. So it's speaking about the people living in the land. God's going to give them over to them and they're going to defeat them. And then in verse 16, you shall consume all the peoples that the Lord your God will give over to you. So he's saying he's, he's going to give them over to you and you're going to defeat them. And at the end of this section, he's going to give them over to you and you're going to defeat them. So it's like brackets holding this whole section together. Between these two verses, again and again and again, in which God promises, I'm going to hand them over to you, and you're going to defeat them, the warning that comes is, as this is happening, do not serve their gods, do not pick up their idols, and do not behave in the way that they are behaving because you're a holy nation. You're to be separate. You're to be different than the nations that you are going in to dispossess. So we read things like this in verse 5. You shall break down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars and chop down their asherim and burn their carved images with fire. Verse 16, the last part. You shall not pity them, neither shall you serve their gods, for that would be a snare to you. Going further on in chapter 7 and verse 25, it says this, The carved images of their gods you shall burn with fire. You shall not covet the silver or the gold that is on them, or take it for yourselves, lest you be ensnared by it, for it is an abomination to the Lord your God. God's people here are called to be different, separate than the nations that they are going in to dispossess. And he's warning them against idolatry, warning them about serving other gods, and warning them about craving and desiring the silver and the gold that is draped on these false idols and gods. We're called to be separate from the nation around about us, the nations that are around about us. And that fact should motivate us to worship God. We're called to be different. If I'm a Christian and everyone around me is not a Christian, I should be different. I should expect to be different. I should expect them to look at some of the things, a lot of the things in my life, and kind of tilt their head and think, he's weird. Not the weird weird, but weird because I'm serving my God, worshiping my God. Now, now the crucial point here, and, and a very wise commentator makes this point, what is called for is separation, not isolation. So, so the church is called to separation, not isolation. It's great when you learn rules that how things are supposed to function, whether it's um, in science or in maths or in English. So one of the things we know is that two positives always make a positive and two negatives always make a negative. And these rules are like set in stone until you come to Scotland. Scotland has the ability of, of changing all the rules in the English language. So we can take two positives, the, the word I, which means yes, it's positive, and the word right, which is positive. 
So two positives, you combine them, and you have this lovely Scottish phrase which means, I write, which means absolutely no. So we've taken two positives and made a no. And the reason that I say that is you can come to the Scriptures and it tells you some things like, be separate, come out from among them, and be holy. So it's like this separation is like isolation, so come out from among them and be holy. But then you get another verse that says, go into all the world and make disciples. So is it come out or go in? Which one is it? It sounds a bit like a Glaswegian bus driver who's trying to encourage somebody, encourage somebody to get off his bus, so he says, come on, get off. You know, come on, get off. Well, which one is it? And what we find here in the Scriptures is it's both. We are told to be separate but not isolate, and we are told to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. When Balaam in Numbers chapter 23 was called to curse the people of God. He was hired to curse them. And what he realized was he couldn't. He can only bless what God blesses and curse what God curses. And one of the things that he says in Numbers 23 and verse 9 is this, from the top of the crags I see him, from the hills I behold him, speaking about Israel the nation, behold a people dwelling alone and not counting itself among the nations. So Balaam is looking at Israel, and he says, look, it's a people dwelling alone, not counting itself among the nations. So there's all these nations on the face of the earth, and yet in the midst of them is the people of God. And they're different than anything else on the face of the earth. And what God is calling Israel to be here as they're heading into the promised land is you're not to be like them. You're to be different from them. You're not to worship their gods or their idols or chase after a silver and gold like they do. You are supposed to be different because you're serving God. When people were to look on Israel, they're supposed to see something different. When people look upon the church, when people look upon the Christian who is worshiping God, they are not supposed to see the same as the rest of the world. You, Christian, are supposed to be different, trying to reach the world with the gospel, but because you're worshiping God, you're not like them. Your life and the things in it are supposed to be different. You're not supposed to be chasing after the idols of the world like power and, and wealth and success. You're not supposed to be chasing after silver and gold. What you are called to hold to at times is going to be totally different from the world. Sometimes, oftentimes, in our present culture, it's hard to be faithful to our God. It's hard to worship Him. It's hard to serve Him when our culture is going in one direction and you are standing and facing a completely different direction. And in those moments, it's easy to look when you're completely at odds with the world and you can feel afraid or, or what's going on. Christian, that's how it's supposed to be. Uh, we worship because we're called to be separate, to be different than the world. Well, we're going to hold to values and teachings that the world is going to completely reject. It may mean that because you're worshiping God, you're going to lose your job. You're called to worship. You're called to be different. You're called to be separate. And when you're persecuted for righteousness' sake, do you know what Jesus says? Rejoice. Give thanks because you're blessed. They persecuted the prophets before they persecuted Christ, and these were people who tried to worship God, and you're simply following in their footsteps. 
Rejoice and give thanks to God. And that brings me on to the final reason. You see, what you find, you can hear what I've just said and think, but that's so hard. Why should I worship God out of love? Why should I worship God out of thankfulness? Why should I worship God? You're actually called to be different. But it's so hard, I know, but here comes the fourth reason. Why should I worship God? Because of the promises of God. Listen to this. This is Deuteronomy 7 and verse 9. Listen to what it says. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love Him and keep His commandments to a thousand generation, and repays to their faces those who hate Him by destroying them. He will not be slack with one who hates Him. He will repay Him to His face. You shall therefore be careful to do the commandments and statutes, the rules that I command you today. And because you listen to these rules, rules and keep and do them, the Lord your God will keep you, will keep the Lord your God will keep with you the covenant and the steadfast love that He swore to your fathers. He will love you, bless you, and multiply you. Multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground, your grain, your wine, your oil, the increase of your herds, the young of your flock, in the land that He swore to give to your fathers. You shall be blessed above all people. The Lord will take away from you all sickness and none of the evil diseases of Egypt, which you knew will He inflict on you, but He will lay them on all who hate you. And you shall consume all the peoples that the Lord your God will give you, will give over to you. Do you hear what he's telling them? The promises of God. And it's almost like saying, I'm, I'm calling you to be different. And at times that's going to be hard. Remember the promises of God. If we are faithful in our worship, we will know his blessing. We will know his love. We will know flourishing lives. Why? Because God is faithful and he keeps covenant. We don't need to be afraid of these people. Why? Because we have God. Listen to this, verse 17. If you say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them? You shall not be afraid of them, but you shall remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all of Egypt. The great trials that your eyes saw, the signs, the wonders, the mighty hand and the outstretched arm by which the Lord your God brought you out so will the Lord God do to all these peoples of whom you are afraid. He says, if you're thinking about being afraid, just remember the past. Remember how faithful God was to his promises. And then we read on in verse 20. Moreover, the Lord your God will send hornets among them until those who are left and hide themselves from you are destroyed. You shall not be in dread of them, for the Lord your God is in your midst, a great and awesome God with love and thankfulness of what God has already done. Even though I'm called to be different, I'm not going to be afraid of culture or the nations because my God is with me. He's a faithful God, a covenant-keeping God who does awesome things, awesome wonders, and the Lord your God will be with you. So don't be afraid. We are promised blessing. It speaks about promised victory, and above all else, the promised presence of God. For the Lord your God is in your midst, a great and awesome God. God was encouraging the Israelites, as you go into the land, as you remain faithful in worship, I will be in your midst, so why be afraid of them? Now, Christian, just think. As we are called to be in the midst of the nations, shining witnesses for our Lord and our King, who told us, go into all the world, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that Christ taught to, taught to us. What's the promise? And lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. 
He's saying that as we are faithful to Christ, as we're faithful in our worship, not running after the things of culture, but worshiping Christ, we are promised the presence of the resurrected Christ with us until the end of the age. Listen to these words in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5, where it says this, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Don't run after silver and gold. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. We have the promises there. Don't, don't run after the things of the world. Why? Because we're promised the presence of God. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. And He's a promise-keeping God. All the promises of God, we're told in Scripture, find their yes and amen in the person of Jesus Christ. If the Israelite thought, this is too good to be true. How can, how can we really believe all these things that are being told that God will never leave us or forsake us, that He will be for us, that He will overcome our enemies? And then the Israelites thinking, do you know what? I'm not sure if this can be true because I know my heart. I, I know the way that I am and, and the way that I've behaved. This can't possibly be true. What God reminds them in chapter 7 and verse 8 is that it's not because of them. He says this, it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath, the covenant that He swore to your fathers. He's telling them, look, you might be thinking this is too good to be true. He's saying it's not just because I love you. I'm being faithful to the covenant that I made with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. I promised them I was going to bring you into this land and bring you into this land I will. I promised them I was going to give them this land and give you this land I will. Their confidence was rooted in the covenant. How much more ours? Rooted in the covenant established in and through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to these words again in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in His sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So then what Deuteronomy chapter 6 and 7 teaches us is that we worship God as a response of love, with hearts overflowing with gratitude because of what God has already done, living our lives different and all those around us who do not follow after Christ. But we're not afraid, because in the promises of God, rooted in the covenant, that Christ has made certain by His blood shed for us, we find that our God has promised to be with us. He will never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He'll be with us to the end of the age. And all the promises of God find their yes and amen in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How can we not worship when we see these motivations, these reasons for worship opened up before us? Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank You for these two chapters in Deuteronomy. We thank You for the way that they speak about things that in one sense we, we know, in another sense it's so refreshing to hear them again. Father, we recognize we love you because you first loved us. We love you because we see the extent of your love displayed in the giving of your beloved Son, Jesus. We thank you that we have a Redeemer, 
We thank you when we were your enemies. You loved us then and you drew us. As we thought about last week, you're the one who turned us and made us feel awful over our sin and our rebellion, that we would confess our sins and plead for forgiveness. All this is of you. And in response, we love you. Seeing how much we've been forgiven, we love much. And Father, when we look back over the time that we've been walking with you, when we look back to the cross of your Son, Father, how thankfulness, gratitude rises up within us. You have been such a good and a faithful God. And Father, we are full of thanksgiving, full of reasons to give you thanks daily, hourly, every single minute. Father, help us to count our blessings and name them one by one that thanksgiving would spill over from us. Father, we thank you that as we follow after your teachings in love and thanksgiving, you call us to be different, that we'd be a witness for you and toward you, that others might see and turn their gaze towards your beloved Son. And yet, Father, we know that in this nation in which we live, in the world in which we live, which refuses to worship you, but wants to go its own way, chasing after idols and false gods and the things of creation. Father, we know that we're called to be different. Help us to be faithful. And Father, when we find ourselves afraid, when we find ourselves alone and different, Father, may these verses cause us to rejoice as we realize we're actually doing what we're called to do. But may your promises, our Father, help us to store them in our hearts and in our minds, that your promises might bring us comfort and strength and courage, that we may press on being faithful to you on account of everything that Jesus has done for us. So hear our prayers, accept them with thanksgiving. For any member of our church, for anyone listening in to this Bible study, even this time, who is struggling or fearful, Father, may your promises prove true toward them. May they be reminded of them. Hear our prayers, pour out your blessing. For Jesus' name's sake we ask. Amen. As always, we'll place a hymn which we we think is appropriate up in the, the corner here, and we'll pop a link for it in the description box down below. And I pray God's richest blessing upon you.